Our other major story tonight, a break in the Unabomber case. FBI agents are searching the Montana cabin of former mathematics professor Ted Kaczynski. Just moments ago, we received these pictures of the suspect in custody sitting in the back of a white truck. He lives like a hermit near the town of Lincoln. He is in custody, but he has not been charged. The FBI has yet to uncover a smoking gun, any bomb parts or something like that, for example, that might conclusively link this 53-year-old recluse from Montana to the 18-year reign of terror caused by the Unabomber. He is not under arrest. Not yet. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor, and writer-producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. Today, I have a very special guest with me. You've met him before here on Real Crime Profile. He's my longtime great friend and colleague, also retired FBI profiler, Jim Fitzgerald. How you doing, Jim? Jim, uh, how are you doing? It's great to be back uh, on the air with you guys. Yeah, it's great to have you back. I uh, haven't had a lot of time to catch up and talk to you, so I'm really looking forward to today so that we can sort of catch up on what you're doing. We have a lot to talk about, don't we? We do, uh, and um, you're part of some of this too, and uh, and it's been, a, it's been a great ride over the last six months or so, and a lot of stuff going to happen in the next six months. So right. yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, so we have a new anthology series coming out on Discovery called Manhunt the Unabomber, and we'll get into some detail about that, but you'll be able to see that on Discovery Channel July through September. It's an anthology series. And then also, Jim, you have a new book coming out, or you it just got published, didn't it? Literally uh, about three weeks ago it came out. Um, I'm, keep, I'm writing my memoir uh, in four different books, because Jim, as you know, people ask us all the time, how did you become a profiler? What was it like being a profiler? Tell us some of your favorite cases. And once I started writing, I kind of couldn't stop. So um, my yeah. first book came out way back in 14. That was kind of growing up in Philly, and we discussed that on the air already, and on my way to becoming a police officer. And uh, my second book, and of course the books are all called, it was just an idea of mine. I've always been a fan of Jules Verne, and he wrote, of course, A Journey to the Center of the Earth. Well, I borrowed from his title and called my books A Journey to the Center of the Mind. Because it's certainly a journey I'm, I've been on, and I'm taking my readers on, and it's well into the mind of me and some of the bad guys I locked up along the way. So That's this great. particular book is A Journey to the Center of the Mind, book two, and uh, the subtitle is The Police Officer Years. Great. And that's what I spent writing about. That's great. And also, hopefully today we'll be talking about maybe one of the more significant cases that you worked uh, during that time period uh, that the book covers. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about CrimeCon. CrimeCon is the first of its kind, CrimeCon 2017. It'll be held in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it's just like Comic-Con for crime. And basically, it's a conference that brings together not only true crime writers and people who produce true crime shows and people who write true crime books like yourself and myself, but also a wide variety of people who make news in the crime arena. Everybody from Nancy Grace to Aphrodite Jones and people like F. Lee Bailey and Ken Kratz, the prosecutor from the Stephen Avery case, as well as myself and my brother Tim and Bobby Chacon from XG Productions, our company. And in fact, Tim and I are going to actually host an MC the entire conference. There'll be Q&A sessions back and forth with these people. There'll be immersive sessions where you actually get into crime solving and so forth and see what it's like to be on a jury trial. All these things are going on. It's going to be great. And we're going to do a live podcast from CrimeCon 17. And we'll do a Real Crime Profile podcast and maybe and a whole bunch of other podcasts will be done there. In fact, our company, XG Productions, is sponsoring the podcast studio. So we will do live podcasts from there as well as all the other podcasters that will be there. And really amazing podcasters are going to be at the conference. It's something that you really can't miss it's everything from Generation Y to Thinking Sideways, Real Crime Profile, Insight, 
and The Vanished. And of course, the Real Crime Profile team will be there. And I'll be launching a brand new podcast with Francie Hakes called Best Case, Worst Case. That's just to name a few of the ones that'll be there. It's really going to be amazing. And for anybody who wants to go, we'd love to see you there. We're giving you a 20% off promo code. And that is Real Crime 20. So just go to the website, crimecon.com, and put in the promo code Real Crime 20. Real Crime, the number 20. And you'll get 20% off any badge for any number of days you want to come to the conference. So that's going to be a real savings for you. So we can't wait to see you there and get involved in some of this crime solving. Anyway, I hope you can come out too, Jim. That would be great. Well, it sounds like a who's who and a how do you do it in the, the true crime genre. So yeah. I would be very interested in attending. It's, we will talk. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be June 9th through 11th. That's Friday, June 9th through Sunday, June 11th. 2017 in Indianapolis, Indiana. So let's start by talking a little bit about the new anthology series on Discovery, Manhunt the Unabomber. I know our listeners have heard you talk before about the Unabomber case, which you were critically important in solving. And we talked before about the show called Manifesto. The name has changed, hasn't it? Yeah, it sometimes happens in Hollywood before a, 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 you know, a TV show or movie's released, they decided to change the name. And I think this is a good reflection of the fact that they want to do some other uh, upcoming uh, series, too, on different cases that uh, the FBI and law enforcement work. In. Very good possibility, some cases I've actually worked. Yeah. So we'll see how that, that plays out. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so it's an anthology series, so that next season it'll be Manhunt. And it'll be another one of the uh, notorious criminals that uh, you or I or the FBI has gone after. It'll be great. Yeah, and this one, I'm really excited. I'm uh, going to finally get on set in about two weeks. We've been negotiating back and forth when to get there. Uh, they're doing the filming in Atlanta. And um, I've, been, I've talked to the actors, the director, and the writer before. We've exchanged scripts back and forth. But uh, they've got some you know, really good writing and directing going on. Sam Worthington, of course has been cast to play Jim Fitzgerald, Fitz. So um, he's a good-looking guy, and he was about my age back in the mid-'90s when all of this went down. So uh, I'm certainly happy for, happy for that part. That's great. He's, uh, he's, uh, he's a Brit, uh, grew up in the U.K. as well as Australia, so he has to kind of suppress his uh, dialect there, but he does a really good American accent. And you'll see language is part of what helps solve the real Unabom case. So without giving anything away, of course, our... Uh, our actor sort of plays off of that down the line. So uh, it's going to be a great eight episodes over eight weeks, and I can't wait till it eventually airs. That's great. And so the series was originally created by us, um, and uh, we sold it to Discovery, and it's basically going to take you through the entire investigation and how it was that eventually... Jim Fitzgerald was able to help bring down Ted Kaczynski, who was a notorious serial killer, serial bomber, known as the Unabomber. Where does the name come from, the Unabomber? Yeah, I'm finding nowadays a lot of people, it's been over 20 years, and they kind of almost forget. They may have heard the name, not sure. But Unabomber, is, the word itself, is strictly uh, an acronym, and it stands for University Airline Bombings. Actually, Unabomb was the first acronym used by the FBI. You know, Jim, we in the FBI love acronyms, and yeah. we put them to uh, case names and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so they, needed, they used to call this case the uh, the junkyard uh, bomber because all the bombs were made out of, like, spare parts. They were deadly and hurting a lot of people, but they were still made out of spare parts very cleverly to keep the Unabomber from being identified. They didn't call him that then. But anyway... It went from junkyard bomber. Someone said, no, he's a university and airline is who he's going after. Uh, let's call him Unibomb or the case Unibomb. And that's where that went. Of course, eventually he started bombing computer stores and academics, computer scientists, things like that. Um, but they kept the name Unibomb throughout. And uh, it's now iconic and known pretty much worldwide. And if not, we're going to make sure we remind everybody starting in July. There you go. 
Yeah, well, the fact is that that's how FBI ma names major cases. And this is one of only about 200 major, major cases in the entire history of the FBI, right? Well, that's a good. I actually reminded myself doing research for my third book. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, this was Unibon was major case 75. And uh, that means in the history of the Bureau prior to 1990 early 1980s, we'll say, uh, there were 74 other major cases. Now, almost every case the FBI works is major to some degree. It's a federal offense, whatever. But obviously some, uh, you know, rise to the top in terms of the personnel assigned, the jurisdictional areas involved, maybe even international. So uh, then Unibom was called Major Case 75, and I know it's well up into the, you know, hundreds now, perhaps even 200, Jim. Yeah. Well, I remember we were both working major cases at the same time uh, while you were working on this case. And uh, I was working in Little Rock investigating, uh, I don't know, a quiet little couple named Bill and Hillary. But um, yeah, and uh, we we definitely discussed this while it was going on. Uh, there was a lot of frustration on the part of law enforcement, right, for years. How long was his bombing campaign? The Unibom investigation began in uh, 1978, and it ended in uh, with his arrest in 1996. So? Over 17 years. The first bombings were in Chicago in 1978 through 1980, so four of them in the Chicago area. And then they started being um, either the bombs were placed or mailed to other places all throughout the U.S., and uh, that's through uh, the last bombing was April of 95. Seems there was two to four every year. He took off about six years starting in 1987. This is the Unabomber because he came, He there was an eyewitness who actually saw him place his device on the ground. And I'm sure people out there, if they rack their memories, they can, uh, they can envision that sunglass wearing, aviator sunglass wearing hoodie on top of his head uh, individual you know, white male mustache, and that was the only clue for a real long time that the investigators had as, in terms of who was the Unabomber. Right. So um, he took off some time because he was almost caught then, or at least he thought he was, but he came back in 93 with a vengeance. That's when he started bombing and writing, and it's his writings. Uh, again, I'm not going to give too much away here, but it's his writings that eventually brought him down, and I was glad to be really the first person in the investigation to really take the writings and prioritize them and look for the clues therein. And you'll see how that all plays out, of course, uh, in the miniseries and also my third book when that comes up. It's one of the longest runs for a serial killer in American history, isn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And you said earlier about the fact that he was called the junkyard bomber and how that was actually something that was a piece of genius. Why is that? Well, he, this guy was very evidence conscious. I know you and your listeners know what that means, Jim, but this is somebody who not only, he not only knew how to not leave evidence behind on his devices or on his crime scenes, but he also employed countermeasures. He also would put in fake addresses, return addresses on his envelopes. He would even put on, um, uh, he even, there was a, there was a blonde hair under one of the stamps and the lab people thought, oh, we may finally have a clue from this Unabomber. Well, here, when all was said and done, when we finally arrested Ted Kaczynski, we realized that that hair was found in a bus station terminal, and he purposely just picked it up on the floor and put it under a stamp and, and mail off his letter to New York Times or whomever, and uh, and that was became a clue, but obviously it went nowhere. Right. In terms of there was never any fingerprints, he would strip the batteries of their skins, to make sure you, that the investigators couldn't even track down the lot numbers of the batteries. So, um, yeah, it was really easy. He was a, a genius. We knew that going in. Nobody realized exactly his level of education and his, uh, his expertise in these areas, but um, it surprised a lot of people at the very end. But um, uh, he wasn't quite smart enough, though, to get by the FBI. Right, but his, his forensic countermeasures really sent people on a lot of wild goose chases for a number of years. And you were able to sort of bring it back and focus on the actual offender because he was leaving evidence where he didn't realize it, wasn't he? 
Well, we and we all do. Uh, if someone's paying attention to how someone else writes or speaks, there's a lot of clues in the language of someone that can paint a picture of who that person is. Now, we don't necessarily do that on an everyday basis. Sometimes we may. We're just meeting, you know, a, a man or a woman for the first time. You're sizing them up, whatever. But or a politician, and you know, of course, they would never lie. But you still want to listen to them and try to determine various things about them. And sure enough, in the Unabomber's writings. There were some clues being left behind, and uh, and you're going to uh, read about that in my next book, and you're also going to see it on the screen when uh, Manhunt the Unabomber airs starting in July. Well, um, I'm really excited myself to see it, and I know you are, and I think the listeners are as well. It's going to be a great series, very, very intense, and it's going to have it's going to be based on your life and your work on this case. And we're really proud of you for um, having this anthology series uh, put together. And hopefully, I know this was a dream of ours um, in 2007 when you were retiring. And I sat you down and said, I want to get all the details out of you before you leave the FBI. Because one day, we're going to write about this. One day, we're going to tell the world about it. And it's happening in July 2017, isn't it? Well, Jim, we said back in 1987 when we first met at the FBI Academy, uh, we make a great team. And guess what? <laughs> we still do. Yeah, there you go. So uh, thanks to you, um, you you know, it was my case and some of my ideas early on, but you certainly spearheaded it uh, in the uh, in the uh, Los Angeles area. And you guys are so good. So, uh, well, yeah, it wasn't just me, though. Uh, Tony Gittleson and I uh, That's sat down and... We both talked to you at length and went through your materials and wrote the uh, the original pilot for this series uh, together. So shout out to Tony Gittleson for that. Um, and we are all really happy that it's finally coming to fruition in July 2017 on Discovery Channel. So we're all looking forward to that. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I even had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. So, next up on the agenda is your book. I'm holding in my hands a rather substantial second volume. Obviously, you put a lot of work into this, Jim. A Journey to the Center of the Mind, book two, The Police Officer's Years. And this would cover the period in which you were a police officer in Ben Salem, Pennsylvania. And... Uh, right up until the time when you and I met at the FBI Academy, as you said, in November 1987. So how did you decide to write out this volume? Um, which, by the way, for the listeners, if you love reading about crime, there's plenty to read about here because this book is over 780 pages long. So it's a serious volume. There's a lot of work in here. A lot of cases, a lot of history. Well, to answer your question, and I don't want to scare anybody off, I, I've been complimented by three or four different people who don't even know each other that I write in a very conversational style. You feel like you're, I've been told, they feel like they're in a conversation when they read me, so, uh, and they read my book. So uh, I'm very complimented by when someone says that. And the bottom line is, this is basically, not just in page length, but I would say in in, in the stories themselves contained therein, it's, it's really like three separate books. It's number one, a young police officer coming of age, naive, wet behind the ears, making some mistakes early on as Sarge kind of has to put him in his place. 
but he's still making some pretty good arrests uh, along the way. In fact, my very first night on the job, and that's like in the second chapter here, I make an arrest which garnered me headlines in the in the newspaper the next day. And as I kept wow. writing in that chapter, I actually had my fellow officers kind of PO'd at me, like, how dare this rookie get front page above the fold, and for the newer listeners out there, that's like the top of the newspaper right below the masthead. How's this rookie get, you know, headlines, his name in there, uh, when I've been doing this job for eight, ten years, nothing. So so it was really a, uh, uh, a great start to my 31-year law enforcement career. And then I just recount going along the different arrests I made, the different characters I ran into, uh, including when I went to a plainclothes unit and I was sitting up in a billboard. You know, I had long hair, I wear denim jackets. I'm looking down with binoculars as guys were stealing cars out of a train station doing drug deals. And they had no idea where the police were coming from. So I'm watching them from a billboard about 80 feet up in the air. Wow. So it was really fun days back then. And nothing like being a rookie cop. You're out for the first time on your own. You're your own boss, driving around in the patrol car. And, um, and uh, you know, you're making, I was 23 years old, making an arrest and, uh, and just taking care of people, helping people. And uh, it, it was really just a great experience in those very early days. Well, I think it will be great for people who are interested in being becoming a police officer because you actually get into the details of what your life is like, what what the politics are, what the back and forth is, what the job really requires. So I think that's a great thing. But I want to say something, Jim. I'm noticing a pattern here because, you, you know, your second day on, you make an abreast that, that was sort of made the, made the newspapers. It was big news. And, and there were people that were a little pissed off at you because you did that because you made made them maybe look like they weren't doing as much i know that you and i had a similar situation when we were on our first squad together the fbi nypd joint bank robbery task force when uh, i was looking into the background and and trying to find a fugitive paul noring and uh, you came out and did some uh, some work with me and we arrested him in in one day and they had been looking for him for like three years, if I'm not mistaken? Well, that uh, little story is covered in my third book, Jim, and I give you all the credit, and you may write about it someday, too, but I summarized it. Yeah, that was in our supervisor called us in. We had our tails within our legs because there's a few technical protocols we may not have followed, but the bottom line is we got our man. Uh, basically, it was your case. You put the whole thing together. I kind of backed you up as you as, as, I, as I you backed me up in other cases, and uh and success at the end, and who knows, a guy may still be in jail, but uh, hopefully he's not hurting kids anymore. That's yeah, sure. that's right. Well, it was important because we got him off the street, and he didn't have access to kids anymore, and, and that's really what our job was all about. But be that as it may, uh, you cover a lot of cases in book two, Journey to the Center of the Mind. Can you pick out one that sticks out in your mind um, that you remember from this time period that you want to share with the uh, the audience? Yeah, I'd be glad to. And there were, um, I mean, there are many cases in here. I, I do get into some politics, as you mentioned, and things got really dour. And just real quick here, some other people have since read the book and say, man, how come nobody went postal back then? You're all carrying guns? I said, I know, I know. There was a whole harassment campaign, that, uh, including mostly against me. I was a sergeant at this point, and uh, there was a good chief and a bad chief, and the good chief loved me, the other chief not so much. So um, a lot of stuff going on there. And I'll tell you, uh, my, one of my first cases as Detective Sergeant, I, um, I actually was just out of old habits cruising around a, a hotel um, parking lot one night, and there I catch a guy, shall we say, in a very compromising position with a young boy. Mm. And it turns out before long, I learned that that night, an hour or two later, he was a Roman Catholic priest. Good Lord. 1980. And um, this was one of the first cases ever in the country in which a priest was, you know, caught, you know, in the act, an on-view arrest on my part. And, of course, I hate to say this, but the church covered it up, and he was uh, at some other parish within six months and, uh, you know, still doing things with the kids. We have no proof that he reoffended since then. But, uh, but that's just one of the cases. A bunch of other cases, a rape case I worked, a poor young woman arrested in a hotel room. I'm sorry, she was raped in a hotel room. But luckily the guy, luckily, if you will, uh, fortunately the guy left a locket behind. 
and the locket had a picture of a woman in it, but we didn't know who the woman was. And I did some detective work on my own, even as a uniform officer back then. And we wound up putting this case together and solving uh, uh, the case of this woman's rape. But I suppose when everyone, anyone asked me, Jim, to answer your specific question, I cover this in the in this particular book. The case that I always refer to as the one I'm most proud of, and uh, again, this is covered in book two, uh, had to do with me uh, in my second stint in parole, uh, in patrol. I was already a patrol officer, went to uh, plain clothes for two years, then back out on patrol. I just I just wanted to get back uh, what, I, what I really wanted to do at the time. And uh, to keep the summary version of this, I watched two cars run through a red light. I could tell one was following the other. But you know what? When you're a cop in a car by yourself, you only stop one of the cars. So right. the one more guilty of the two was the second car. Um, so I pulled him over, no tag. He had no license ID. His hair had a funny shine to it. He was really acting squirrely. I knew he was lying to me. And But, Jim, my first forensic linguistic analysis took place on this car stop. Oh, yeah? And that's because, that's because he had a yellow legal pad uh, on his dashboard with 25, every line had an address on it. 25 different addresses. And I should add here, my PD was Ben Salem PD. You said that already. We're a northern suburb of Philly. Any given time, it's about 100 sworn officers. And so Philly was to our south, but there were other smaller suburbs you know, to our north, to our, to our uh, west. And all these addresses were listed down, but none of them had towns next to them. And I didn't recognize any address except one right in the middle. I'll just call it 1234 Oakford Road. Mm-hmm. And this guy's lying to me. He's shaky. He's squirrely. No tag on his car. He's running a red light. I knew he was following somebody. He denied that. Long story short, um, I said, all right, let me go back and check on you. You know, radio check. Nothing comes up of it. All of a sudden, beep, beep, beep. And every police officer knows what that means. That's when a major crime just occurred. Comes over the radio. Uh, officers, you know, uh, be on the lookout for a white van. Uh, there was a, uh, a robbery and a uh, home invasion at 1234 Oakford Avenue. Wow. In my head, I remembered that address on that middle of that pad. Right away, I jump out at gunpoint, get, get his gun. He had a sawed-off shotgun in the car, and we wound up arresting the people in the van before too long, and, uh, and, uh, and we, we slowly put that case together. Um, so that was one of my favorite cases because it wasn't a result of a call. It wasn't a case I was assigned. It was me being a hardworking and astute cop, if I do say so, doing my job and then piecing everything together from there. Didn't you, didn't you have a conversation with him about you doing your job that night and how well you did it and, and what the result was? You've obviously read the book. Or yes. It, Jim. Um, two years later, we didn't catch all the guys in the van that night. Uh, there were two, two ran and two were arrested. We knew there were two more out there. This guy, is in, he's, a, he's an outlaw biker, this guy. He wasn't wearing his colors that night, no motorcycle. But these guys went to rip off a family, and they tied them up, put them on the floor, beat them up, uh, really, really manhandled this family. The guy's parents came over. Man. He goes to jail. He winds up pleading guilty. We had so much evidence on him. Two years later, I get a call at the police station uh, to collect. Yeah, this is uh, so-and-so from uh, you know so-and-so uh, penitentiary. I want to talk to you. I want to give up the name of the two guys. I got together with the assistant district attorney. We drove up state Pennsylvania and we sat for three hours talking to this guy. He admitted everything. Of course, he's already in jail. He admitted his role. He gave us the names of other people, and we were going to start building our case with this guy. The ADA leaves the room for a few minutes to call his boss, and we're sitting there, and I'm sitting across the table on this guy. This guy was a badass, and uh, he was no one to mess with. Uh, and um, he just looks at me from uh, with no one else in the room. He said, you know something, Fitzgerald? I don't know if you know this or not, but you came very close to dying that night. I said, I did. So I'm trying to be cool here and stoic. I don't want to let this guy you know, think he has me. Yeah, he said, everybody got to tell you, you did your job so friggin' well. I didn't use that exact word. You shined the spotlight of the car in me. You had your, your handheld flashlight under your arm. Your hand, your left hand was hovering around your pistol the whole time. I'm a left-hander like you, Jim. And uh, I just knew you would have beat me to the draw. But you know I had my salt off right in the seat next to me. And if you wow. gave me one split second to pull it on you, I would have. Wow. But I got to tell you, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, Fitzgerald, but you did your job really well that night, and you're alive for that now. Wow. This well, guy had a long criminal record, violent history under his belt. I have no doubt, having just pulled a major robbery, uh, and I didn't even know it yet when I first stopped him, 
I could have very co- close. I could have come very close to being killed if I, I didn't practice all the skills I learned in the uh, the police academy from four years before. Yeah. So that's why this case, for obvious reasons, always sticks in my head as something I did. You know, on multiple levels, I pride myself in having done well. And Jim, uh, all these years later, I'm here to talk about talk to you about it on your podcast because uh, I did in fact follow those protocols well. Well, and and that those two lessons in that one is that protocol is very important and there's a reason for it because police officers and police agencies are are taught all the incidents in which police officers around the country and and sometimes around the world get into situations where they get attacked or assaulted or killed and they train on those incidents to try to avoid them and the tactics that you used are as a result of other officers who lost their lives or who were shot or injured in the in the course of doing a traffic stop, which most people don't realize is the most dangerous thing that police officers do, right? Absolutely. And and in the third or fourth chapter of my book, uh, just real quick here, just what you said to reinforce that, um, I'm a brand new rookie cop, three weeks on the job. I'm so full of uh, piss and vinegar, ready to go. And I love my job, everything about it. And then here a cop from like three towns over is killed one night, uh, mm-hmm. arresting a burglar just at a department store, just like I did on my first night. And here, I got to tell you, um, he made a mistake. He handcuffed, he caught the guy, you know, got him under control. And he said, put your hands out. And he handcuffed him in front. Mm-hmm. Somehow, after he was handcuffed, he got the officer's gun, shot, and killed him. Mm-hmm. And that was my first ever police funeral and it was ever, ever etched in my head, always. First of all, never trust a prisoner or an inmate. And secondly, you know, always maintain complete control. And even today when I see a young officer or a rookie FBI agent, whatever, sometimes, Jim, we'd walk through the academy before we retire, some young guy, I just come in, always cuff behind the back, always cuff behind the back. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because that's been so uh, emblazoned in my brain yeah. because I would have this guy, I know this cop, when I was at his funeral, the 21 gun salute and all that, and I said, boy, <laughs> if I got to go, it's not going to be because I didn't handcuff somebody how I was taught to do it. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, you know, it's it's just, it's really a sad commentary, but it's the fact that we have so many people out there, so many guns, and so many people who are willing to use them against police officers but at the same time, there, I, we, you know, we'd be remiss in if we didn't mention the fact that there are situations in which police officers use their guns too easily, and uh, unfortunately, other people have lost their lives um, in those situations. Obviously, the training goes both ways. It's to protect you, but it's also to protect the citizens that you're working to protect in the first place. So I'm looking at uh, your book, Journey to the Center of the Mind, book two, and I notice it has a very interesting artwork on the, on the cover. Um, is there a particular reason you uh, chose that? Well, I am very proud of this cover. Um, I'll take credit for coming up with the basic design to it, but a mutual friend of ours, Jim, uh, Stephen Jeter, of course, is the artist behind it, and I commissioned him and he did a great job and Stevens out of New York and LA and, uh, and, and basically, and anyone can go on Amazon and look at the cover, uh, or my website, which I'll throw out now, www.jamesrfitzgerald.com. But I'm very proud of it because it shows basically in one bottom corner, a police, you can tell it's a police officer's hand. There's a few stripes on his, uh, on his shirt and he's holding a string, which goes up to like a kite. You think you're going to see a kite at the top, but it's actually a gold badge of Detective Sergeant. And you have a lightning strike coming down and breaking the badge in half. And it's also hitting the police building that's next to it. And lightning strikes are going into that building and obviously, you know, hurting the building too. So what the connection to all this is, is my town, my former town of Ben Salem, is where Ben Franklin did his kite experiment wow. back in the... 1760s, 1770s, wow. uh, you know, founding father, Ben Franklin, 
And we used to go, or at this Groudon Mansion, it's called, and right on the fields, we knew where the, where the experiments took place. So I figured I would play into that whole thing and have the police officer holding the badge up as if on a kite string, and here comes the lightning bolts, but ripping apart the badge, ripping apart the building, which when you get into the political aspects of my book, kind of the, the middle sections when things really went to hell in my PD with one boss filing, firing another and other people getting let go, uh, you'll see where the lightning strikes play in here. So there's yeah. uh, kind of a double meaning to that. But, but Stephen Jeter did a great job. Uh, again, I gave him some basic ideas. He took over from there. And uh, there's even a handcuff key on the string if you look close. Yeah. And that's supposed to be the key that's attracting the lightning. So I actually had a, I think somehow he came up with what a handcuff key looks like. And he added that in there. So, uh, uh, so I'm very proud of this cover, and uh, he may be doing the cover on book three. We're we're trying to figure that out right now. Great. Well, what's amazing about it is how you tied so many thematic points into that one piece of cover art. Uh, it's really yeah. interesting, and uh, so is the book. So I really think uh, our listeners should should grab that book and and check it out. So it's on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, and ebook. So uh, you have your choice. Uh, that's great. Well, Jim Fitz, I really appreciate you coming on Real Crime Profile again and catching us up on the things that you're doing. I'm really excited about what's happening in 2017 for you, and can't wait to see the the fruits of our labor on the Discovery Channel Manhunt, the Unabomber show that's coming up soon and i hope that uh you'll get, come back and talk to us maybe as the series is airing because we'd love to uh follow up and talk about the real details behind the episodes as they air and maybe even before that see you in indianapolis there you go well I heard it's beautiful in june yeah i'm sure it is so that's crime con 2017 in indianapolis indiana on June 9th through 11th. And we hope to see you all there. Until then, signing off on Real Crime Profile, this is Jim Clementi and James Fitzgerald. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family, and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Zumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the U.S., if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233.